Hey guys, it's Michael from Fire and Brilliance and today we'll be talking about a subject matter that's very important to the industry and we've been kind of uh, going over this for quite some time uh, in the business and it's still going on today and that subject matter is actually about ethical sourcing. So is a diamond that's been said to be ethically sourced, is that possible? Okay, And the reason why it's so important is because of the fact that there are so many people out there that want to make sure uh, that a diamond is ethically sourced, that they're purchasing something uh, that is not financing um, a country of conflict. Right, uh, but uh, the biggest question of all is how is that possible? Is it possible? Uh, does that even make sense? Uh, so I'm going to actually break it down for you, and so that you can have your own opinions on it. Okay. Uh, so first of all, the, the number one thing that I want to first of all go over is what is the definition of a diamond that's ethically sourced? All right. Uh, there, everyone has a different definition of it, but there are three big definitions uh, as to what I want to go over and the, the issues or the social issues uh, as to what people are concerned about. And those three items is, um, is it a blood diamond? Uh, does it uh, require child labor? Uh, or is it eco-friendly? Okay, so uh, what, what does it even mean to hear when people say, is that a blood diamond? It's a, it's a term that's been thrown around uh, in the diamond world for a long time, okay? So a blood diamond, if you guys have seen a movie by Leonardo DiCaprio uh, about uh, 10 years ago or so, in 2006 I believe, he made a movie called Blood Diamond and it's actually uh, based on true events where uh, there are some countries or there were some countries that had a lot of civil war uh, where they used their natural resources resources or diamonds okay as a currency to finance the war right so therefore they were being called or, uh, or tagged as a blood diamond because it was financing a lot of bloodshed war uh, and um, chaos right and um, so a lot of people that saw that movie or were aware of it before and after that movie do not want to support this at all whatsoever because of the fact that hey why would I buy something that is supporting uh, you know, chaos, war, bloodshed, right? Uh, so, is it a blood diamond, right? Uh, the second part is, um, is it requiring child labor, right? Um, a lot of these countries um, that has um, mines with natural diamonds um, may be um, hiring children to mine for these diamonds. So for a lot of activists and social groups that are against child labor, uh, that may be something that they are against and they are not for, they do not want to support. You know, um, I, I do have uh, my two cents on that opinion as well. Um, you know, trust me, I have two kids, right? I have a five-year-old boy and a two-year-old girl. I, I, I will work for them until they're 60 if I have to. They will always be my kids no matter how old they get, right? So I don't believe in child labor, but I'm also a realist. Not everyone is, lives in a country that is developed to have social laws that protect children and government incentives to help people. Say hypothetically, if I was 12 years old and I live with my grandfather who can no longer work, I'm going to be working to make sure I bring some food on the table. So there, you know, there, there are certain things that you do have to think about, uh, but for the most part, I get it. You know, child labor is not the way to go, but if you're put in a situation where you have to, um, you know, then there should be some kind of, there should be at least discussions about it, right? Uh, but yes, and, and the third thing is eco-friendly. How does it affect the natural world? How does it affect the environment? How does it affect wildlife? How does it affect, uh, you know, the ecosystem that is around uh, the mines that are, are, are being mined uh, because it does affect it, right? So, um, you know, for people that are going for a greener world, uh, a greener earth, uh, to protect the environment, that may not be something they, that they want to support. Uh, so ethical sourcing can be more than just three main points, uh, but these are the three main points that are talked about quite a bit, so I want to make sure I cover the main points, but there are so many other reasons as well. So uh, the point number two uh, is, is it possible to prove 
that ethical sourcing can work, right? Uh, and before getting into that, I do want to kind of go over a few points, right? So the point is, the United Nations, right, uh, came out with this uh, plan. It's called the Kimberley Process, okay? Uh, and this, is, this Kimberley Process was actually established in 2003 to prevent conflict diamonds in war-torn countries, uh, going back to the blood diamond uh, thing, right? So, uh, so basically, let me read a few of the uh, processes and requirements for you. Okay, so you do have uh, these countries do have to be a member of the Kimberley process uh, and have to implement these requirements to ensure that uh, the integrity of the process is actually upheld. Okay, so uh, and that basically does require that each shipment of rough diamonds crossing an international border should be transported in a tamper resistant container accompanied by government validated Kimberley process certificate okay each certificate must be resistant to forgery uniquely numbered uh, and describe the shipments contents right the shipments are only supposed to be exported to other KPCS or the Kimberley process certification scheme uh, participant countries all right. Uh, so failure to comply with these procedures may lead to the removal of a non-complying member country. All right. So so basically, what this whole process uh, did is that the United Nations stepped in and said, "Hey, let's do something about this. Let's no longer support blood diamonds. Let's not support the blood diamond trade. Uh, they're using as currency. Uh, let's stop this chaos, and we need to stop that uh, currency." Right. So for the members or countries that are involved has to follow uh, this specific process in order to trade uh, and be considered conflict free, right? Uh, so that's the idea. And it, it initially started with great intentions. However, over the course of the last decade and a f plus a few years, um, you know, there's been a lot of situations um, and I don't want to uh, go over all of the situations here. So, you know, obviously, you know, with the Internet nowadays, anyone could just, you know, Google it and, and, and look it up. But uh, the thing is that it's been proven quite difficult to implement. OK, and as a matter of fact, one of the uh, points that I want to go over with you, OK, is that the certification lost a large amount of integrity after the global witness walked out on the Kimberley process in December of 2011. Okay, the Human Rights Watchdog, they stated that the, in recent times, the governments of Zimbabwe and a few other countries have all this honored breach and exploited the system without bearing any consequential penalties for their infringements, okay? Uh, and there's been scenarios where the Kimberley process, although they have good intentions, uh, these were not upheld. And these diamonds were still being used uh, for specific things that they were not supposed to be used for, right? So, um, you know, as, as a, an industry, as a world, as a, a people, uh, we have created something that came with great intentions, but the problem is that it's been proven very difficult to implement because of the fact that diamonds, at the end of the day, are valuable. Uh, to the extent that it can be used as currency. Uh, so when it, it, it is in the wrong hands, sometimes that cannot be controlled. So the process of a diamond, okay, of a natural diamond, I'm not talking about a lab created, I'm not talking about a moissanite, I'm talking about a naturally mined diamond uh, that has been formed in uh, earth, right? Uh, basically the entire process from the time it's been mined to the moment that is on a uh, a ring on someone's finger, right? Uh, it goes through many, many, many processes, right? So diamonds, uh, if you don't uh, know, diamonds, the natural form of diamonds, actually looks like a, a clear rock or a clear pebble. It doesn't look like that shiny, glittery thing that most people will think about after it's been nicely cut and polished. It's really just a clear uh, rock, right? And it comes from uh, mines, right? And there are mines all over the world. Most people will think about countries in Africa uh, as to where these mines are from, uh, but uh, they actually also exist in Russia, in Canada, and also in Australia as well.
okay? Uh, so from the moment it is mined, uh, then basically what it does is that uh, what these people that owns the mines or these people or these companies um, that um, unearth these, these, these diamonds uh, will basically create a group. They're called site holders, right? Site holders are basically big, big, big diamond manufacturers. And, and what I mean by manufacturers is not creating it just, you know, like Moissanite or lab created stones. They're called diamond manufacturers because what they do is they actually cut and polish these rough diamonds to make into the, the, the sparkly, nice polished diamonds that you see uh, in the stores, okay? So these site holders, they, they have to purchase a certain volume of diamonds uh, from, from one period of time to the next to be considered a member of the site holders, right? So they purchase a lot of rough from these companies that unearth these diamonds, okay? So they go to these site holder meetings and, and, they, and then they purchase a, a bunch of rough, right? And then they go back to uh, wherever they're from uh, and then they start to polish and cut the diamonds. And these diamonds mostly are cut in countries such as Belgium, China, Israel, USA, and India being one of the largest diamond manufacturers in the world. Okay, so you know when I was at GIA, I talked to a lot of people, uh, and a lot of people that I spoke with, they mentioned that you know as high as 80 to 90 percent of the diamonds in the world today are being cut, polished, and manufactured from India. Okay, uh, so then once it is manufactured after purchasing from the site holders, uh, then they are sold to wholesalers. And when then the wholesalers are finally then sold to retailers and the retailers are sold, uh, then sell it to the end consumer, right? So this entire process right here, there are multiple, 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 even though there's only three hands here, there are way more hands touching the rough diamonds from the time it's unearthed in the mine. So the person that unearthed the, the diamond is one person, then it goes to the owners or the executives of these companies that runs these mines, and then it goes to a meeting with the site holders, and then it goes to the manufacturers, right, that purchase these diamonds, and then it goes to the wholesalers and the retailers. And within this wholesaler and retailer process, it may even exchange hands more times, because sometimes one wholesaler will sell, sell to another wholesale will sell to another wholesaler will sell to another wholesaler before it even gets to uh, a retailer that may end up selling to another retailer that may end up selling it back to the wholesaler that may end up selling to another retailer before it ends up going to the consumer right so there's so many transfers of hands and that is very difficult to control the great idea of the Kimberly process right because then you will have to trust every single person in the process. And of course, there's a way to do it. Of course, there's a, uh, a group of people that can't possibly do it based on trust, right? Of course. But uh, at the end of the day, the exchange of hands, there's really no control, and therefore there's always going to be little loopholes uh, that has killed the integrity of the Kimberly process. Ethically source. Is it possible? Is it possible that we can ethically source? The answer is yes, but, right? So what, what that means is now that you know the entire process, the only way, well, not the only way, of course, is based on trust. You can always trust that your partners can do it with you. But one of the ways to truly control the whole system from beginning to end is if you actually own the mine, you unearth it, yourself, you actually manufacture, cut, polish it yourself, skip the wholesaler, skip the retailer, and sell it directly to the consumer. So you own it from beginning to end, you're not working with anyone else, and you control the whole thing. And then you're monitored by someone else, by a third party agency or something like that, to prove that it's never exchanged uh, hands, right? Um, so, you know, uh, it's just, it's very similar to cash, right? You could take out, um, you know, $20 from your pocket, $10 from your pocket, $5 from your pocket. Can you ever prove what the previous person purchased, what the previous person spent it on, what the previous, it's, it's currency, it's currency, right? So a lot of companies that will say that, you know, their diamonds are conflict free or ethically sourced, uh, does it mean that it's not true? No. Does it mean it's true? No. You just don't know because it's truly a matter of a trust process based on this whole line 
uh, or chain of, uh, of, of partnerships with your business partners that you have to trust that everyone is ethical along the way and trust that you can backtrack that right to really prove that's ethically sourced um, so so that so it's very hard to guarantee something like that uh, but unless or, or unless you own the actual process okay uh, so then that leads to my next thing so so when it comes to lab created gems lab created gems uh, lab again if you guys follow me in the past lab created gems are just like natural uh, gemstones the only difference is that it's created in the lab right so a, a, a lab created diamond is made of the same component as a natural diamond. Both are made of almost 100% carbon, right? So you still can't control what that person bought the lab graded gem will do after he's, he, he bought it. But if you're not going to resell it, if you're not going to use as currency and you're going to buy it from, um, you know, from a lab being sold to a retailer, then being sold to the end consumer, then one of the most effective ways to be sure that you have a higher, higher, higher percentage of purchasing an ethically sourced gem is to go with a lab created gemstone. So with that said guys, I, I, I hope you guys got great value out of this. Uh, this is definitely a subject that um, it's not talked about a lot because it's so controversial. But I think it's very important that people should know about it because we do live in the modern world with modern people that use technology and information and people should know what they're buying. Uh, so with that said, guys, I, I, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, thanks again and I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.